future. Okay. Great. All right. All right. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. All right. Sorry. sorry. And then just just an extra thing. Could people mute so as not to get any back feed? Yeah. 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 Obviously, I can't at this minute, but. Um... Okay. All right. Sorry. I think after all that, we're we're okay to start again. <laughs> So if you'd like to say what you thought you were going to do. Um, okay. okay. Um, uh, well, it is extraordinary to be meeting at this time. Um, as as uh, several here know, I, I was um, invited to give the Lord Mayor's Peace Lecture uh, back in January in Coventry. Um, and uh, I began sort of slightly apologetically. Uh, I said... Why, when there is a short, no shortage of active conflict in our world, do I choose to make nuclear weapons a priority? The issue is dormant, some might say, just as the weapons themselves lie dormant. Many say that with nuclear weapons, but specifically their deployment as a deterrent, we have established a global peace more durable and robust than we have ever known. My goodness, that feels uh, very dated now. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, the issue of nuclear weapons is right at the forefront of uh, humanity's concerns once again. Um, and, uh, and we don't have uh, global peace. Uh, we certainly don't, and we don't even have peace in Europe. Um, what I thought I might do, Jill, is, is return um, to a section of that uh, lecture um, to see what that sort of sounds like now uh, yeah, in the midst thing, of yeah. this war. Um, and I, I've, I, I feel that its arguments have been strengthened rather than undermined. Indeed, urgency has been injected into them, but uh, maybe that's something we could dis discuss together. Um, yeah, that, that, that sounds a very reasonable. Does that sound thing. Okay? Yeah, but, that but, sounds but, fine. Yeah. But before doing that, I maybe I just share a little bit more about myself um, and uh, the sort of journey that I've been on. Um, and, and I just read a paragraph from a book um, that I'm hoping to send off to the publishers quite soon. It, it's actually a book about Mary, Jesus's mother. Um, Anne had a little bit of a preview of a little bit of it last night, actually. Um, it, 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 it's called Mary Bearer of Life. And so it, it really tries to work with this universal theme of life. Um, I, I think I'm reasonably confident about writing and speaking in a theological stroke devotional um, way what I've tried to give myself what I've tried to discipline myself with since coming to Coventry and undergoing another conversion I would say since being in Coventry which is about the radical application of Christian faith to the world as it is um, I've also tried to I do this in the book. I, I end uh, each chapter with a sort of ethical uh, reflection or experiment, as I've called it, which tries to apply some of these um, theological uh, realities, as I would call them, to matters of ethics and ethic of life. Um, and one chapter, which is the chapter on Jesus's ministry, and it explores what might have been uh, the influence of Mary on Jesus's own ministry, his teaching, his work, including his comment, his proposal that the peacemakers are blessed, um, that they're happy, that they are doing God's work. Uh, 
um, were, 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 was in some way influenced by Mary. And then the um, ethical experiment at the end of that chapter on Jesus's ministry um, looks at um, the question of nuclear weapons. Um, uh, and so a lot of people won't buy the book, I should think, because of that, but I thought I'd have a go anyway. Um, this is just a paragraph from that section. The world has changed since the relative stability of the Cold War era. The nuclear deterrent had a simple logic on its side when two forces stood against each other, held in balance by the mutual threat of destruction. There was a Christian realism of the 20th century, which, however reluctantly, accepted that maintaining a capacity for nuclear attack was necessary to hold the peace until each power moved in close step to disarm. And then here's the confession which might uh, disappoint you, but I hope it will actually encourage you. I held that view myself. That was a view I held. But, and I hope this will be the encouragement to you, but the inherently more complex geopolitical realities of the 21st century, the failure of the non-proliferation treaty to deliver on its promise, the development of tactical nuclear weapons which risk both lowering the threshold for the use of nuclear weapons and thereby triggering full-scale nuclear war, these things have changed my mind. I hope the encouragement will be for you that if I have had my mind changed, other minds might be changed as well. I also say, furthermore, the experience of living with the effects of the Second World War bombing of Coventry, Dresden, and other British cities, combined with ongoing reflection on the application of the deep truths of Christian faith for every dimension of life, including international politics, has changed my heart. I think I, I think we may just have an opportunity here um, for hearts and minds to be changed as we confront uh, the what the realities which you have been putting before the world for many years. Well, Jill, stop me if this is getting too too heavy or too tedious. No, no, uh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Please, please go but, on. Yeah. But what I'll do, and, and, and dear Ruth and Anne, and, and I think one or two others have sort of heard all this before. Um, so also tell me if, no, we've heard this before, we don't want to hear it again, but I, I felt I needed to go back to what I was saying in January and see whether it, it held up or whether, you know, I'd got it wrong and I needed to go back to my former views um, because of the war. So I'll, I'll just have a go at this and, and gloss it slightly by, uh, by the present situation. Picking up this lecture about a third of the way through, I said, what I'm working towards is the basic principle that under underpins that which you'll know well about, the humanitarian and initiative and the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. The basic principle that underlines both of those uh, initiatives is that the mere possession of nuclear weapons is an affront to human international humanitarian security and that it is also an affront to the legitimacy of the, legitimacy of the state which is expected to act justly, proactively, and positively in the light of what human security and flourishing should look like for everyone. But I go a bit further than that. 
we need to revisit the idea that it's not simply the possession of nuclear weapons that is a problem, but also their very existence. Their existence perpetuates an entire set of risks. That's what I think we're seeing coming before the world in dramatic terms. I'm acutely aware of the precarious global security situation, which for many stands as an obstacle to disarmament. And that obstacle, I think, will, 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 will get stronger, at least in the mind of our own government, and, and which would seem to render the TPNW, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, impotent. Of course, an improved security situation will, will be more conducive to a multilateral process of disarmament. I'm pessimistic about the state of international relations. But I think we need to approach the problem with at least some awareness of the fact that nuclear weapons are part of the problem. The deteriorate, that a deteriorating state of international affairs can simply perpetuate the risks they present and that decisively pursuing a course of disarmament might unlock some wider solutions along the way. Now, in relation to the war, I mean, it was said to me fairly recently by a, a, a very senior, senior and eminent person, in fact, a bishop um, retired now, but I respect him greatly. Um, he said, well, the existence and threat of nuclear weapons is protecting the world from the Third World War. That was very much his view. And Well, I said, I'm not quite so sure. Perhaps it's the existence and threat of nuclear weapons that have been one of the causes of the war. Now, this is debatable, of course, but fears that Ukraine would rearm itself uh, in a nuclear way may have contributed to the war. Whether that's the case or not, the existence and threat of nuclear weapons, I think, empowered Putin. For he knew that their, the risk of them being used would actually contain uh, the reaction of the West. So I think they played a part in this present instability and awfulness that we have. In the light of that, I firmly believe that we need to grab the issue of the existence of nuclear weapons and the doctrine of deterrence by the horns. And I feel that more strongly now than I did in January. This must be our point of departure. The existence of nuclear weapons by some states establishes potential rationale for deterrence by other states, which for whatever reason, feel that the greater their stature on the regional or global stage, the more robust a security guarantee they need. Therefore, although the non-proliferation treaty would claim to have severed the link between deterrence and proliferation, well, I'm not sure about that either. Both China and India in tandem, in tandem with the scale of their geopolitical ambitions are expanding and modernizing their nuclear forces. We're still in an increasingly bi-multipolar world, horizontal proliferation is likely. And at that stage, the restraints imposed by the non-proliferation treaty could begin to fail rapidly. For these reasons, I fear that we cannot claim to have solved the threat of proliferation until we have a firm grasp on the process of disarmament. The logic of deterrence is simply too self-reinforcing and self-perpetuating for it to be otherwise. Recent article in, in The Economist, which warned of a potential upsurge of nuclear proliferation, summed up the logic very clearly. If nuclear weapons are not going away and security threats are worsening, 
some states will be tempted to pursue a bomb of their own. In other words, I wrote this in January, the proliferation of nuclear weapons is in large part conditional upon their very existence. Um, and I think that's what we will see um, during the war post-war. Um, uh, in order to defend ourselves from states uh, that are aggressive, like Russia, nuclear possessor states, will not other states be saying, we need these as well. We need them in order to deter and therefore proliferation, which is a sort of rationale for the um, non-proliferation treaty, of course, um, is completely undermined. As the world changes, nuclear dynamics are bound to shift. And I'd much rather if we decisively and collectively commit to a downward trend rather than opening the gate to a chaotic upward trend simply because we believe that we could remain at cruising altitude indefinitely. That again, I wrote in January, I think what we're seeing uh, now is that we cannot remain at cruising altitude indefinitely. Sooner or later, and I genuinely fear sooner rather than later, things are going to go horribly wrong. That's why the TPNW is a reminder to nuclear weapons, to nuclear weapon states, that the success of non-proliferation is intrinsically bound up with the success of disarmament efforts. And in light of the disheveled state of international politics, proponents of the TPNW, recognizing that we have a doomsday alarm clock to beat, and it's ticking pretty fast at the moment. Proponents of the TPNW have decided to cast the threat of nuclear weapons in humanitarian terms, not unlike, for example, climate change and the pandemic. The security of the NPT stands on its vision of a nuclear-free world. That's what the NPT stands for. The check on proliferation is directly related to the promise of disarmament. And that's what I think has been forgotten. And so the TPNW injects momentum into Article 6 of the NPT. Of course, the Treaty for the um, Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons won't achieve very much by itself, but that's exactly the point. It's meant to reinforce the non-proliferation treaty. If the existence of nuclear weapons is the problem, then their total elimination must be the solution. The TPNW seeks this nuclear free world in no uncertain terms. It doesn't beat around the bush. But this need not preclude a step-by-step -step consensual multilateral approach as our own government um, persistently argues that it does. In fact, I have any, in fact, I have a sense that any step-by-step -step approach is doomed to failure if we are not resolutely clear about our aims from the outset. A world free of nuclear weapons, global zero, must be our ambition. And no one can be allowed to shift the goalposts at any time. I say that because I am all too aware of how fragile a process of multilateral disarmament is likely to be in a multipolar world. Indeed, I suspect that a world with fewer nuclear weapons than there are now has the potential to be even more unstable, especially if the threshold for the use of nuclear weapons is lowered. Indeed, the process might feel uh, like it is getting more precarious before it gets more stable. If an aer in an aeroplane's flight path, some of the most dangerous moments are often just before landing, but it has to land in the end. The TPNW helps us by providing us with a handrail to hold on 
hold on to as we descend the steps to global zero, a means to maintain trust and confidence with, with each other through the process by a laser sharp focus on the goal. Therefore, the TPNW is not simply providing part of the framework for, for governing a nuclear free world. It reminds, us, it reminds us that the goal must be our point of destination to which we must be utterly committed. The current nuclear environment with states enlarging and modernizing their arsenals, more states wanting to acquire them, shows that the goal of elimination needs all the reinforcement we can muster. The remarkable hold of deterrence theory perpetuates the problem. But this is to a large extent an outworking of the very existence of nuclear weapons. And therefore any meaningful attempt to tackle this doctrine must be governed by the ultimate goal of their total elimination. This imperative is the stark reality which the TPNW presents with us. The world's possessor states have been remarkably determined in their dismissal of this treaty, which they claim has the power to do very little. But surely they could at least recognize that its power lies in its fundamental rationale that ensuring, which is that ensuring non-proliferation depends upon a commitment to elimination. This is the clarity which the TPNW determinedly injects into the process of disarmament. Would you like, uh, I, I can, Stop there, and that's a nice be thing to do. There was a little more that I could say, um, but I, uh, I don't, I don't want to sort of uh, uh, risk repeating myself too much. Um, uh, but so I'm in your hands. Whether you want me to stop now and we can discuss. Um, to, well, I think probably there are quite a few contributions for people to want to make from yeah. the floor. Am I correct? I, I let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's do that, and then maybe at the end you can come yeah, back yeah. and sum up. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was thinking of this part of the meeting going on until about eight. So if we've got, yeah, you yeah. know, um, so I think Tom's got Tom and Roger. So if I take Tom first, um, if you want to unmute yourself, Tom. Good evening, everybody. Could I um, support uh, what? The bishop has said 100% and simply back up the fact that recent months uh, operationally have justified exactly what he said. Um, I took a lot of interest in the um, NPT at the United Nations, and of course, this was not unusually one of the first year, one year where it failed. It has not been accepted in terms of its final uh, statements for nearly 15 years. And on this occasion, um, it was um, Russia who, who stymied the whole thing, um, which is deeply unfortunate. And there were many, many uh, nations there who regretted the fact that Russia had stymied the acceptance of, of consensus of the NPT. Now, the other important thing is that what's happening now over Ukraine should make us more determined. There is urgency injected. And I would just like to reflect on those two words, prohibit, prohibition and proliferation. If you read those treaties, they are in a sense, almost diametrically opposite because they have very different ends in mind. One is trying to stop the spread of nuclear weapons. One, the, the other one wants them uh, prohibited and has some very good reasons for prohibition. So much of what the Bishop said was backed up by 
a much forgotten treaty, the Bucharest Treaty, mm. which I'm sure he knows about, and other accords signed between Ukraine and Russia. The Bucharest Treaty is, is interesting in that Russia mm. gave, an uh, gave an agreement to not infringing Ukraine's territorial integrity, as they put it, uh, if Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons. Well, Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons, but of course in 2014, Russia broke that accord. And, and that was when the warning signals went out, which really, in a sense, the West was very, very um, complacent in looking at. And it was only, I think, in November of 2021 that the Americans started monitoring the arms buildup uh, and then sending out signals. So I agree entirely with what the bishop has said. My only addition is to look at the NPT and the TPNW in the context of common security which is a phrase that has uh, mm. i've been very interested in um there is a new paper out called common security for our shared future 2022 which i would recommend which puts the whole idea of what is security what does security mean and when you read it you realize there are some very good and powerful arguments there that make a complete nonsense of of deterrence uh, and in fact <laughs> deterrence is an extremely dangerous policy but I, i'm sure i don't need to convince some of you guys about about that so I'll, i i've got lots of other points but i i think i've had it, had enough time there so i'd like to pass on to somebody else thanks tom yeah sorry Ro roger you you were next yeah mm. right well <laughs> Bishop's remarks have made my heart flutter, actually, because uh, it's a wonderful, a wonderful new look on it. And uh, I would like to read it, actually. It's so kind of complex in, in a way. But, uh, yeah, I would love to uh, go forward with that myself. But uh, I spoke to Andrew Mitchell about, uh, about TPNW. That's a Tory MP, me, me being a very great friend of his, been a member of the Labour Party. And uh, he said, I don't want TPNW, but I am happy with, with uh, the, the previous treaty, the TP, the, the uh, NPT one. He actually agreed on that, which is quite interesting, isn't it? But the practical side of what, what you've just said there, Bishop, is uh, TPNW was was uh, an attempt to get some agreement, which they did in the UN. But who didn't have uh, agreement with it was all those nuclear holding states. And who hasn't signed it is all the nuclear states. Our government, the UA UK government, they haven't even agreed with the thing that the uh, UN had uh, massive uh, support for. So I, I still, I would still, my first reaction is that I still want to press those states to sign the flipping thing before we go any further. Thanks, Ronnie. Um, Ruth? You need to un unmute Ruth. I'd like to thank Bishop Christopher very much for his talk tonight. And I was lucky enough, um, together with Anne, to hear his lecture in Coventry, which was memorable and made a big impact. And um, as a result of that meeting, we had a, I convened a small group, which um, the Bishop was kind enough to come along to to meet with the Lord Mayor and a few other peace activists and members of the Lord Mayor's Peace Committee to see how we could take forward his support, our support for the TPMW in Coventry. Um, and a letter was sent to the leader of Coventry City Council to that effect with the support of the previous Lord Mayor and um, the Deputy Lord Mayor and the support of Bishop Christopher. Um, so far, we've had no reply 
and no acknowledgement to our letter. So at the last meeting of the Lord Mayor's Peace Committee, um, our secretary, David Fish, asked Councillor John McNicholas, who was the previous Lord Mayor, if he could chase up what's actually happened to that, um, to that letter and to see if we can get an acknowledgement and a response from the council. But um, obviously we have a lot of work to do to build up support amongst the population of Coventry and with, um, I, I, well, amongst the population of Coventry, I think before we get much of a response from, um, from the city council. Um, I would like to ask Bishop Christopher's views about the current war in Ukraine, because I feel this was a war that we could see coming for several decades mm -hmm. with the kind of demonization of Russia that's gone on over a long period of time. And um, the fact that NATO countries have been surrounding not only Russia, but China as well with the very alarming AUKUS treaty and the orchestrated attacks that we hear from Western leaders on China. This isn't in any way to exonerate the awful um, invasion and war of, of um, Russia in, in Ukraine. But I do feel that it's important for all of us to try and understand the perspective of the Russians instead of this constant pouring of oil on the flames, really. And um, my question is really to Bishop Christopher, what do you think the response of governments and um, social movements, particularly the peace movement, should be to try and de-escalate this terrible war? I mean, one of, one of the petitions I picked up, which Anne kindly um, housed in her wonderful exhibition following Hiroshima Day in the Chapel of Unity in Coventry Cathedral, had written, it was a, a petition asking people to sign, um, give their support to the um, MPTW. And somebody had written at the top of one of the petitions, Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons. And so I think the two issues are very much bound up with each other. And I think the kind of threats that are being made by Putin are utterly terrifying, actually. And I think the response is equally alarming because there seems to be no movement to try and find um, some sort of peaceful solution and compromise to this war. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Do you want to answer that now, or do you want me to see what um, Philip has to say and, and do? Well, shall we see what Philip has, and then maybe if I try to make a response to, to, to all four? Right, okay. Yeah, okay. Philippa, do you want to come in? Uh, uh, yes, thanks. Uh, sorry that I've got everything off, but uh, I've got a poor internet connection. Um, Bishop, thank you so much. You've given me so many very, very, very useful phrases in your talk to use uh, to counter when we're doing leafleting in the streets and things. But one thing I didn't, if you could just elaborate, I didn't quite understand your approach to um, step, step by step, or, well, you didn't say piecemeal, but piecemeal, um, disarmament by multi multilateral disarmament versus unilateral I, I i just i didn't quite get what you said on that mm. Mm. if you could just elaborate a bit whether you think that any particular country disarming or getting rid of its nuclear weapons which i think south africa did didn't it mm. um, if you think that that's actually not going to be useful uh, i wasn't quite sure what you were what you were getting up there if you could just yeah go back over it thanks yeah yeah no thanks philippa um but uh, gosh thank you for those responses i I'll, I'll never be able to give adequate um uh replies um but because they've each of them has made me think some more um yeah i suppose to um just a, a, a little thought um, in response to Tom and, and Roger, and, and maybe 
it, it's not unrelated to, to Philippa's point as well. Um, I suppose I'm, I am someone who tries to, to look for, for common ground, um, to look for a point at which the best of, of, of what people are trying to achieve, as it were, through one uh, set of ideas and policies, and the best of what others are trying to achieve by another set of ideas and policies, even though they look diametrically opposed, is there some sort of common ground um, that might actually um, that, that might actually overcome the polarities, if you like, and the sort of Andrew Mitchell response and the response I've had on the floor of the House of Lords. No, we're not even going to even think about it almost. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, NP, we're an MPT country, MPT government, and we're not going to even consider that other treaty. Um, what I think, where I think the NPT has has failed, is is over disarmament. Um, it it, it um, nuclear weapon nations and the person who wrote that comment on 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 the on the piece of paper in the exhibition are obsessed with the concept of deterrence, and 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 convinced that. Deterrence is the way to security. I, I, I think that's being exposed as a very, very, very uncertain ground at the moment. Um, but I think we have to remind the our government and remind them pretty, you know, strongly that MPT is um, is committed both to non proliferation and to disarmament. So I think in a sense, there is some sort of common ground. Um, uh, some of you will know Matthew Murphy, who um, was working with, with me for a couple of years and was, was hugely, uh, hugely um, helpful to me in many ways. Um, we managed to send him uh, to, I think it was to Vienna uh, for the, um, uh, for the review conference of the NPTW. Um, and we got him in as the official Anglican Communion representative. <laughs> so he wasn't just in the sort of fringe side, you know, he was actually there um, as an observer of the main thing. Um, and it was very depressing that, that, that there was no engagement from the UK, um, even though... I think most of the signatories of the MPT, of, of the MP, of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, are also signatories of the NPT. So surely out of respect for them, there ought to be some sort of engagement with the uh, TPNW. Um, so I'd like to find some sort of common ground. And I think, what, what, I, what I'm proposing is that the common ground is found in, in the commitment, the treaty's commitment, NPT's commitment to disarmament. What I think the TPNW does is to be just much more focused about that. And, and I think this might relate, to, oh, I'd love to read that paper, Tom. Um, because I think what it's doing is it is also talking about the security of people, but it's saying it doesn't work with nuclear weapons to talk about nation state security. Because the use of nuclear weapons will affect pretty much everyone, depending on the scale, even small scale will affect uh, huge numbers of people beyond uh, the, um, you know, be, beyond those who use it and those who respond, you know. And, and therefore, this is a question of security, 
but we just need to think bigger and more determinedly about security. Um, so I, 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 I think I think there is common ground. I think we can even find some common ground in security. Uh, but but I think we've got to get away from a narrow view of nation state security. You know, at the end, of, I mean, if Britain en ends up out of this sort of, you know, not bombed, well, that will be, you know, that will probably be some help to me. But uh, if if there have been, if there have been nuclear warfare um, in Ukraine um, or even beyond, um, you know, then it's going to have a massive impact on me and and and, and everyone else. So um, that then. Oh, I think sorry, yeah, and then Philippa, yeah, I do believe in um I do I do believe that, and I didn't at one stage, and this has been part of my change, part of my wider Coventry conversion. Incidentally, I should tell you that the experience of being in Coventry has reconnected me with the with with the um uh death of my grandmother in 1918 as a result of um, an air raid uh, mm. of London in Germany. Um, and uh, I, I've come to hate bombs. Mm. And, and I've also come to put no confidence in violence. Mm. And that's been part of my conversion as well. And I'll come on to that in a moment, uh, Ruth. Um, but so I, I do think I do think we should, I do think Britain should disarm as an action of um, uh, yeah as, as 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 an action uh, um, of moral based on moral imperative um, and also as a way of showing that. A significant possessor nation is prepared to be brave enough to do this. And that its people are saying, we no longer, you do not have the legitimacy to certainly use nuclear weapons. Wouldn't most people in the country say that? But also, I've joined you, if you like, in saying we should not even threaten, um, not only because there is a strong argument, it is morally abhorrent mm. to threaten destruction on that level, but I have also come to the more pragmatic principle or belief that it is it is simply too dangerous to go on living like this. Um, and if there's anything of hope to be found in the present situation, it, it, it may just be that on the one hand to rely on bluff, and we all know that deterrence relies on this sort of mind game of bluff and its sort of moral credibility is based on, well, it's only a bluff, isn't it? Well, that may not be the case. Hmm. That may well not be the case. Um, and then the other, perhaps, sort of, I don't know, little bit of hope to, to, no, I think it's more than a little bit, actually. I think I, I will pray that it will be the beginning of something quite big, is I think the present situation is once again facing us with the terrifying reality of the of, of the use of nuclear weapons. You know, we can no longer say, well, you know, they were used in 1945, and then we learned that they just needed to be used as this sort of political tool for peace. You know, that's the deterrent theory, isn't it, doctrine? Well, you know, once once you've seen that that you know, they could very well easily be used. I don't think it will take much for them to be used. Um, and that then maybe relates to, to, to Ruth's question. Um, 
I mean, I think there is a really important analysis, analysis that needs to be given, uh, conducted um, on, on, on the way Western and NATO policy has, well, to what extent it has helped create the conditions for this war. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that is important. Um, I'm conscious, though, that I, I speak with a Ukrainian family in the house. They've just arrived. They came on Saturday. I have to say, I thought they came from the west of Ukraine, and uh, they were coming here because it was safer than the west of Ukraine, but they weren't in the most immediate danger. It turns out they came from Bucha. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they had to flee on the day of the invasion. And uh, they've told some terrible stories about what has happened to their friends and family. Um, you know, none of that sort of analysis of, of the causes of, of, of what we might have contributed to the causes justify you know, what is happening. Mm -hmm. there are, there's a great evil that is happening. Um, and it is terrifying. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, the risk of not de-escalating are really high. Um, I saw a text from a senior leader in the Russian Orthodox Church, um, which said, don't push this man into a corner. Uh, this is a, a hierarch in the Russian Orthodox Church who knows Putin well. Somehow, we need to, um, to uh, to um, ensure that we do not force him into a corner. He's already set up, I think, um, you know, uh, the, 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 his, his, his response if that corner happens, if, if he is in that corner. Um, but I have to say that although a great evil has been done. I, I'm not convinced that the policy of meeting violence with violence um, is serving the world well. Um, maybe I shouldn't say any more than that, but um, history will judge. But the cost is already extraordinarily high. Mm. Um, Richard, I, I, will you... I would like to think there Sorry. was another way. Sorry. Sorry, no, I, I thought you'd finished, and I think Richard mm. might have been wanting to speak. Is, is, is that... You need to unmute yourself, Richard? Yes. On Tuesday, I was chairing a group called Progressive Faith, of Muslims and Christians. Mm. The topic was about fear and faith uh -huh. and how fear was necessary or not necessary, whatever. That's a great I go along with what you're saying very much, Bishop, because I think to introduce this element of fear into any part of our lives is by definition negative. Mm. That fear is, a, is not about the love and the care and the self-regard for Putin or whoever it may be, say, look, you have to creep Putin, but you know, we're still supporting, but you cannot behave like this. But I'm not going to drive you into a state of your, your fear, you know, that you will respond in a, in a fearful way. Because when you make a dog fearful, the dog bites you. Mm. I think mm. to base the argument on the, that the value of fear is just foolishness and mm. it's not practical or theoretically good. Mm. 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 Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, so, I, I mean, I agree with all your instincts, Ruth, and with um, Taiwan as well. Um, I think the way we are 
and I don't, I, I mean, I am, I, no, I must give the Prime Minister a chance, but uh, from, <laughs> you know, what we've heard in the past, um, I, I'm not over hopeful that um, there will be that capacity to to try to see both sides. And I think this is extraordinarily difficult. I'm finding this, I've got a bit involved in this terrible dispute in Armenia. And um, I'm trying to give us, you know, as much support as I can to the Armenians because I think great cruelty is being inflicted on them. What they really don't like is talking about the, when the British government, in this case, does talk about both sides, that, that, that both sides uh, have something to do uh, to bring about mm -hmm. peace. It's not mm -hmm. just one side which is the aggressor and one side is the victim. Um, that's a really difficult narrative for the Armenians to hear. Um, but there's truth in it, uh, because the Armenians did some pretty awful things to the Azerbaijanis in the past, if not in the present. I think the Azerbaijanis are being unspeakably cruel in the present. But there's a history there, and 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 we all know that diplomacy and reconciliation is somehow, you know, listening to both sides. Um, yes. Um, we, we must finish. Oh, so uh, Martin, I think you've got your hand up. Hello. Do I sound okay? My microphone plays up sometimes. No, no, we can hear no, you good. fine. Yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, for, just briefly, for those I don't know, I've met some of you, but I'm um, a member of National CND and I also mm. help to run um, Christian CND, oh. uh, which is why I've not much engaged with West Midlands CND, despite living in the West Midlands. Uh, and where, where are you in the West Midlands, Martin? Uh, rugby. Oh, right. oh, bless you, yeah. Yes. Yes, I was at, at the um, Hiroshima Day service in Coventry Cathedral. Yeah. Um, oh. so, <clears throat> so it's good to be here this evening. I just wanted to um, reflect on what I've heard. I mean, lots of interesting discussions and giving us all some good arguments to use when we're talking to people. Um, but I think especially in Christian CND, we've come mm. to the conclusion that things will change when large numbers of people get involved. Yeah. Uh, as we've seen maybe with the, the sort of environmental movement, um, yeah. it, it's when it becomes mainstream. Yeah. And, you know, we've got what, 14 of us here tonight. Um, there'll be probably a couple of hundred at the CND AGM in a couple of weeks' time. Um, how do we uh, have you any thoughts um, on how we, how we get this out to the masses? I don't know, Martin, <laughs> except to say it's not working. Mm. I mean, yes. it, you know, these great uh, doctrines uh, of deterrence and disarmament, they're, they're not working. Um, the world is different. And, and it may just be, and this is the sort of, you know, the, the spark of hope to that, that may just come out of this it may just be that the world that we pray god that that you know the work you know that putin and 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 the west and you know will 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 back down from the use of nuclear weapons i'm not you know i am seriously worried uh, that that won't happen uh, but but the fact that there, there is that serious worry um is this the opportunity to reignite um, uh, that energy that that there once was? Um, that these are real risks. Th th this isn't. I mean, as as I sort of began, um, and as I once believed, their deployment as a terrorist has established a global peace more durable and robust than we have ever known. Well, we're now in a different global situation. And we are, you know, we are facing that existential risk um, that it was more easy before this to say, well, it's still working. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think 
but if it's any encouragement, Martin, um, it it wasn't difficult to um, to get a, a lot of bishops to in the Church of England to say, yeah, we're for the uh, the TPNW. Uh, you know, we're not we're, we're we're not, and I think they were, you know, in a sense. You know, crude, straightforward unilateralists. I mean, I've I've given the slight, you know, the the the. Oh yeah, I didn't fully answer your question, Philippa. Maybe I'll come back to that. So, I, but I, yeah, sorry, yeah, but and I think you know, that that was very different from, uh, if you like, the official position of the general synod articulated in general uh, of the Church of England articulated in general synod, you know, uh, previously that, uh, you know. Um, uh, we can see that nuclear weapons have a sort of place, although we're very committed to, uh, you know, multilateral disarmament. And uh, just uh, just on that, Philippa, I think part of the common ground between the two treaties is to say that um, uh, uh, nuclear disarmament needn't, the, the, the TPNW doesn't insist that nuclear disarmament begins, that happens immediately, you know, um, uh, although I do think Britain as a sort of, you know, a moral lead in the world, um, well, could reclaim being a moral lead by by unilaterally disarming. Um, I don't think it makes much difference because, you know, we, we don't have a big uh, stockpile anyway. Um, but I think there are there are ways in, in the TPNW for, you know, it does say, you know, there are there are ways in which um, uh, you know, it can happen in a in a in a in a in a uh, in a sort of staged way, but the big difference is there is um, uh, a, 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 an absolute commitment to disarmament, and, and I think that's where the common ground could be. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think Anne's got a hand up. I know, I think one or two other people have, but Anne hasn't spoken yet, so if we could. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Just uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's one of the meetings where you hear so much that you really want to go on unpicking and having more discussions, just so much in there. Thank you, everybody, for that. And thank you, Christopher. Um, just um, very some very practical things. I think um, we're all asking the same questions. One of the huge things that we have to um, get people to realise, I think, is the absolutely vast and immoral amount of our money that be, yeah. is being spent on this. Yeah. And at the moment, when we are facing the most appalling economic crisis, I think part of our education to, um, to reach others is about this money and the fact that real security is not in this. It's in about the basic needs that people have um, in all the things that people are going to be suffering through this winter. You know, that money could be transferred and so solve the problem. So I think um, we need to make that more that information more available to people. I also think that um, many of you like me will remember the um, all the, the you know the government um, nuclear booklets and things and all that we did to uh, to bring out our own things and the exhibitions we put up. But I honestly think now that there are huge numbers of people who, including politicians, who have no idea what nuclear weapons are and do. Mm. Um, they really just do not know. I think they think they are just big and bigger bombs. Mm. And I think we have a, a real education mm. task ahead of us to remind people again um, what these things are and what the impacts on our regions, our areas, ourselves will be if somebody lets off, they call a small or a tactical new tactical new. Um, and then um, the other thing is the constituency of the faith communities, because um, the, the morality of all this, the morality of um, having and threatening and wasting money on things that will kill people and destroy the infrastructure and the environment, um, it, the immorality of the whole thing is, is you know, huge. Mm -hmm. And in our, in our faith communities, I think there is a huge job to try and get that aspect of things uh, realized and how um, 
we just can't support the the threat the, the existence the the manufacture the waste of money in all of this so i th i think our, we we're almost going back several stages to where we've all been before <laughs> saying we've now got this work we have to remember that a lot of people just don't know what we've been living with for years you know the, the we've been involved in it and other people haven't um so you know just those practical things to think about as well as all the other discussions that i'm sure many of us would like to have i agree with that um, entirely and, and and maybe maybe this is a moment this has become a moment i think so okay um sorry uh two points right okay um we should be finishing this bit fairly soon but I, am i right that philippa roger and tom have still got their hands up yeah Okay, so if, yeah, okay, so if I go through you each but and you speak quite briefly and then then the then the, uh, the bishop wraps up. So Tom first then. Well, simply to say that the common security report is on a website called commonsecurity.org. I can send the full report to Westbiddle and CND for the bishop if you like. Thank you. And two other quick points. Um Aidan Little is the ambassador mm. to um, the UK. And the only bit of encouragement he gave me at the recent NPT was to say that the government is going to engage with the conference on disarmament. And it is also going to engage with, I'm not sure quite what the context is, but it's the, the conference which reduces fissile materials. Yes. So the government is going to engage in that so that is just a couple of small things if they're believable that they are determined to do so i'll wrap it up there thank you very much it's proved to be extremely thank stimulating thank you so much thank you tom there, uh, oh. for those of us who pray i think he you know, is it the i think the ambassador aiden is it adrian we, aiden we, little we, yeah aiden, i like him i think he's a you know he's a good person um but you can tell he's sort of you know he's a deliverer of government policy but i think it, i do think his heart's in a good place <laughs> roger yeah just two uh, three three points first of all that book i don't know how many of you have seen that uh, the first casualty of war is truth mm. and that was written by uh, uh, peter philip knightley in in the uh, 2000s and it's still absolutely goes through all the wars that we've been involved with and mm. how the truth was not given. Then there's the and associated with that, of course, is the fact that I've been saying I've been on some U3A uh, discussions and uh, uh, I keep saying we have been making Russia the enemy even after we destroyed the Soviet Union. It wasn't good enough to destroy the Soviet Union, we still made them an enemy, and that is really, really. Uh, part of what's happening um, and then uh, and finally today in parliament if you can have a look at that there was a debate on the ukraine and it was i mean i'm ashamed of the labor party what they said uh, was about arming ukraine more and more arms being poured in just like the bishop said uh, violence and violence that's what our parliament is saying and it, it's just awful they, it's on record of course what so many of them said terrible okay and thank you thank you roger um philippa hey um i'm glad you just asked me kind of last because what people have been saying has given me the idea that um national CND, we should kind of start a campaign called Rethink <laughs> Nuclear Weapons, because that could bring up again the realities. And um, as Anne said, um, people don't know what, don't realise, you know, it's not a bigger bomb. So I, I think that we should, re to re-emphasise the campaign, it should be Rethink nuclear weapons 
But on a more negative side, I need to remind us all that um, Jeremy Corbyn uh, was bold enough to say he would not use nuclear weapons. And um, he was pretty well slaughtered, caught crucified, if you like, for that type of um, approach by the powers that be in this country. And our Labour, uh, Steve McCabe, when I've approached him in the past and others in the area have, he says, oh, well, that's the cost of an insurance policy. It's some kind of insurance policy. So I say to people, yes, it certainly keeps elephants off the grass. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's that's somebody who was bold enough and he... Um, he would never have been allowed to get anywhere near being powerful in this mm. country. Mm. But he's still a voice. Mm. Mm. Thank, thank you, Philippa. So if, yeah, and, and, and yeah, if the, the bishop would just like to wrap up, I don't really have any final Well, no, no, to just, just, just to thank you. And as um, Philippa was talking there, I, I thought well, uh, an influence on me with the uh, this book that I'm writing, um, and particularly the ethical sections, is uh, um, uh, Hannah Arendt, Arendt uh, oh, the German yeah, philosopher yeah. and ethicist. Yeah. And um, I found her helpful as I've been sort of asking these questions um, and trying to pose questions for social policy, for government, really. She, she she has a simple principle. We must at least, a responsible society must at least think about what it's doing. And I think so much of what we we do and and allow our policy to be has not really been rethought through in the present in in in, in the reality of of of, of present events and I think that applies in all sorts of ways so I think there's a it's a it's a, it's a rather sort of limited thing to say but I, I think it at the very least we must think about what we're doing so mm. I, I I I warm to the idea that 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 concept of rethink you know is it not is it not time just to revisit the arguments and see whether they still work today mm. The final thing is 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 um or the penultimate thing to say is um that I hope uh you will see in me some sort of sign of hope uh because I have rethought and I have uh changed um it can be done um and uh, that's been partly heart, but I think that is part of the, the deal. The heart needs to be moved by the, the real horror. Uh, and it is partly head as well. So although I am embarrassed that, you know, many here got their decades before me, um, uh, I think the fact that someone can change is a sign of hope. Um, and and uh, I can see that being replicated as people think about what is really happening. And in a sense, are forced to think by these present events. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um... Thank you ever so much. I mean, that was you know really, really good, really, really good presentation and discussion, and has given us all a, a lot to think about. I hope Pam's recording um, uh, succeeds. If it is, are we are you happy for us to send it out to the wider? Yeah, very happy. Yeah, very yeah. happy. Right, okay. Very happy. And is everybody else happy with that? Because your faces will appear on the. Oh yeah. 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 But anyway, I think. I think it was very, very useful. Can Can I just ask when your book is likely to come out? Um, uh, I, I hope sort of Easter time or right, around, okay. you know, okay. depending on how quickly the publishers can turn it around. Um, right. 
Jill, thank you for your kind words. Yeah, thank, that, you thank you so much. To be yeah, with you. That was the final thing I wanted to say. Thank you. And thank you for your perseverance through the years. Well, well <laughs> thank you very much. And it is very encouraging. I mean, the fact that you have changed your mind is, you know, and, and it's very moving that coming to Coventry, um, you know, led to that, in part at least, led to that. It's very, you know, and it does give us hope. So thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, we need to carry on with the other part.